from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello and welcome. My name is Kate Julian, and I'm the deputy editor of the Sunday Outlook section at the Washington Post. The Post is very proud to be a charter sponsor of this festival again this year. Before um, I move on to my remarks, I want to remind all of you um, that the Pavilion's presentations are being filmed for the Library of Congress's website and for their archives. Please be mindful of this as you enjoy the presentation. In addition, please do not sit on the camera risers that are located in the back of the Pavilion. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here today to introduce Newbery Medal Award winning author Rebecca Stead. Re Rebecca has been writing since she was a child, but until relatively recently, she worked as a lawyer, not as a writer. She did some writing on the side, but it was always writing for adults, until, as she puts it, the universe intervened. One of her sons, when he was three or four, accidentally pulled her laptop off the dining room table. With it went all the very serious, grown-up stories that she had been working on. Rebecca said this about what came next. It was time to write something new, something joyful, to cheer me up. I was pretty grouchy about the lost stories. I went to a bookstore, bought an armload of books that I remembered loving as a kid. I read them. I went back to the store and bought more books. I read them, and then I began to write. We are so lucky that she did. Rebecca's first novel, First Light, tells the story of a boy named Peter who joins his parents on an expedition to Greenland, where they are studying global warming. While on the ice cap, he encounters a 14-year-old girl named Thea who has never seen the sun because she and her people long ago retreated to a secret world beneath the ice. First Light was greeted by reviewers as an exciting, engaging mix of science fiction, mystery, and adventure, and as an intriguing look at how global warming is affecting the Arctic regions deftly woven into a coming-of-age story. Her second novel, When You Reach Me, the recipient of this year's Newbery Medal, is set much closer to home, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan during the 1970s. This is the neighborhood in which Stead grew up, and it is the same neighborhood in which she and her children live today. When You Reach Me revolves around Miranda, a sixth grader whose world starts to unravel when her best friend, Sal, is punched by a kid on the street for no obvious reason, then starts to shut Miranda out of his life. Meanwhile, the apartment she shares with her mother is broken into, and she starts receiving a mysterious series of anonymous notes which correctly predict the future. When You Reach Me has already attracted a very devoted following of readers who are hailing it as a future classic, one in the traditional of ma tradition of Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Stead. Hi. Wow, it is a great, great pleasure to be here. Um, in the past few months, you know, I've gotten invited to some bigger things. <laughs> and this is um, no doubt the biggest so far. Um, so I'm going to begin. If you can't hear me, can you please wave? And I will try to project a little bit better. Because I really think it's frustrating to sit and he just hear muffle. So please do wave at me if you can't understand me. Um, I'm going to start by reading you an excerpt of the instructions to the authors appearing at the National Book Festival. <laughs> Presentation guidelines. We ask for personal talks. These are excerpts, so I'm skipping words. Not traditional readings. Another way of looking at it, we want to feature the author's personal perspective and personality. Some authors spend part of their presentation talking about how and why they became a writer. Poets may read complete poems, but should not read very long poems. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to read you a very long poem. And I, I was trying to think, you know, how I could tell you a little bit about my personality. <laughs> it's not that easy, but um, you know, I think a pretty good way to start might be telling you about a dream I had last night. So last night there was this swank um, author's party, and it was 
fabulous and there were really good cupcakes and it was you know one of the fancier things I've been invited to and I went back to my hotel room early so I would be rested for today and fresh for you and I had you know demented s stress dreams <laughs> so here's the dream I had last night um, I dreamed that I was going to be filming a, a short scene in a movie and so the next day I was going to have to get up and say some, I had some lines I had memorized. So uh, I, I, I got to the filming spot and I, I had my lines perfectly memorized. I like to be in control. And they said, okay, great, so we'll take care of that. And then we're going to do the second scene. And I, I had no idea what the second scene was. So I said, well, whoa, wait, what's the second, what's the story in the second scene? So the second scene turned out to be a long, wordless story about a dog who falls in love with another dog. And I was to play the dog <laughs> who falls in love. And I was going to you know, be expected to go around on all fours and, and you know, tr fall in love as a dog. <laughs> and you know, I think these dreams are helpful to us as people because we wake up and instead of thinking, oh boy, I have to get up in front of a lot of people today, you get up and you think, thank God, I don't have to do what my sick brain was just coming up with. <laughs> um, so I do want to tell you a little bit about how I became a writer. And um, I want to save at least half of our time for questions because you know, what's really special about being here is that this isn't a blog, you know, it's not Twitter, it's not Facebook, where, you know, and I love those things. I, I like feeling sometimes. I like being in touch with people that, that way, but this is something special. I mean, we're all here in this time and place together. We're looking at each other face to face, and I, I would love to answer questions. That's, that feels like a conversation, and it feels natural, and it's what I like best. Um, so, okay, here's my brief story about becoming a writer. I am born. Not too long after that, my parents split up. So I grew up in New York City um, as an only child of divorce. <laughs> and I have really terrific, um, truly wonderful parents. And I had a very happy childhood which included a lot of time alone. And I spent a lot of time reading. And when I finally hit that sweet spot where books could take me places, where I wasn't working to read, um, but I was just sort of writing the story, I, I, I became really emotionally entangled with books. I, I felt incredibly strongly about them to the point where I didn't even really like talking ab about books with people because those felt like my, my places and they were personal to me. And if you have been there, that's great for you, but I don't really want to think about it because they felt like private, special worlds. And Saul Bellow, who for some young people here um, is a writer, um, said that a writer is a reader who is moved to emulation. And I think for many, many people, at least, that is true. And it is absolutely true of me. Um, the only thing is, uh, there was a lot of fear mixed in with my desire to write. And, you know, f I don't even know if it's a bad thing, but that fear stopped me from trying to write for a long time. Um, I started writing in my head, but I wouldn't put things down on paper. And I think the reason was that I was afraid of being disappointed. I was afraid that what was on the paper wouldn't live up to my own um, fantasy, really, of what my book would be. And you know, I've talked to a lot of people um, who seem to feel that this is really a major obstacle to, to writing. A lot of people walk around wanting to write. And I have a theory that, you know, Every kid knows 10 people or a couple of people who write all the time and who have big stacks of stories. And I think for every kid who is compelled to write and who has stacks of, of you know, stuff to show for it, there's a kid who has a, 
a, a, like a burning desire to write, but who isn't putting down any words at all. And I think that both of those kids can become writers. Um, it's probably going to take the second one a lot longer than it's going to take the first one. But um, they can both get there. And I was that kid who was writing in my head, but I never, I didn't get many things down unless I was specifically assigned to do so. Okay, so I, I think I can really describe my childhood as stepping toward writing and then away from it. So in high school, I worked in the program office of my high school so that, specifically so that I could get myself into a creative writing class, which was taught by a great writer named Frank McCourt. And everybody wanted, yes, he was wonderful. And everybody wanted to get into this class. And you know, your chances just weren't that great. There were a lot of people in my high school class. And you really couldn't take it till you were a senior. And then even then, your chances were pretty slim. And so I decided that I would work in the program office because this was back in the day where someone just wrote down your program on your card. And I figured that I could just, if I didn't get it, I would just change it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I actually didn't, so I spent you know, my lunch period for about three months working in this office filing so that I would have the opportunity to do that. But then with all of that passion and, and need to be in this class, the way he taught was to encourage us to write and then to have us stand up and share and read and that was how it worked. And I could never stand up. I mean, the entire class went by and I could never get up on my feet. And, you know, that was a lost opportunity because that's how the class worked. Um, after college, okay, there's that, this big moment. College I skipped because I, I mostly studied psychology. I did take a college, right? I did take a creative writing class, but again, I dropped it. It's that stepping away, you know, which I think was about fear. Um, so after college, there's that big moment, you know, you're deciding, everyone's asking you what you're going to do with your life. And I decided that I would go to law school, which is what I did. And the reason I went to law school um, was because I had taken a practice LSAT test and done pretty well on it. And I thought, oh, well, here's something I'm, I'm good at. So that's what I should do. And instead of sort of facing the unknown and some, you know, writing, which is what I think was the closest subject to my heart, I thought, you know what? I, it would be easier to do something that I know I'm going to be pretty good at. And so there were these, you know, years and years of tiny steps forward and back. And... It was during my years as a lawyer that I finally started moving toward writing in a more serious way. And I think it must have been because I finally got old enough to see that I really was at the point where I was going to have to start, you know, um, working harder toward my dream. And... You know, I have one other, I'm, I'm at my point where I really want to take questions, but I want to say one other thing, which is that even after I decided I'm going to write, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I care about most, I, s I, wouldn't, I didn't tell people. And again, it was that desire to protect myself from disappointment, I think. And uh, then I got encur an encouraging letter from my editor, Wendy Lamb, um, after I sent her um, a manuscript for my first novel, First Light. And her letter basically said, there's something here, but it needs to be honed. It needs to be stronger and tighter. And um, she helped me create a writing community, which is something that is essential, I think, to every writer. Um, we really need each other, even though we work alone. And um, she helped me create a community of writers. And even when I was working with these writers on this book, which I then actually had hopes of getting published, at this point I was forced to admit to a few you know, friends that I was trying to write. And you know, I constantly put down my own work. I would say I'm working on my stupid book. And 
you know, I, again, I, th I was trying to protect myself from disappointment by putting down my work, I think, before somebody else could do that for me. And so what I want to tell you is that that doesn't work at all. <laughs> um, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't feel good to call your work stupid. And I'm assuming that I'm talking to at least a few aspiring writers here. And second, it doesn't protect you from the disappointment because there is no protecting yourself when you're doing something that is meaningful to you. Um, so there you have my personality and my path um, to being a writer. And what I would love to do, I'm really hoping you'll have questions. If you want to just say them from your seat, I can repeat them. Or there's also two microphones that anybody can come up to and ask a question about writing or New York life. Oh, I had it. I could. Oh, good. Someone's going to a microphone. I was going to say I could read. But I for actually, one thing Frank McCourt did, if nobody would stand up to read their creative work, we had this grammar book called Warriners. I don't know if it's still around. But if nobody stood up, he would just sit on his desk in the front of the room and he would sing, Warriners, 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 except he sang in this wonderful Irish brogue, so it was great. And that was like the threat, you know? Either get up and start t talking about your fiction or we're gonna do grammar. So I don't wanna resort to that, yes. <laughs> Okay, so in When You Reach Me, uh, one thing I want to say is let's avoid spoilers because When You Reach Me has a big surprise at the end. And um, if you could form your question, and that this, this, this is not a spoiler, it's a great question, but if everyone could form questions that don't reveal the ending of the book, that would be terrific. Um, so in When You Reach Me, Miranda, the main character, is a 12-year-old New Yorker living in the 1970s um, with her single mom. And her mom has just gotten on to the $20,000 pyramid, right? And she's going to compete, and they're finally going to have it made because money is a struggle. And Miranda helps prepare her mom for the game. And a lot of what the game is is guessing categories. And so as Miranda is trying to untangle a very complex, weird, story in her mind, right, which is sort of a lot of what the book is, she is thinking in categories because at the same time she's trying to untangle this mystery of these anonymous notes she's receiving and various other mysteries in her life. Um, she's helping her mom practice and the big money round in the $20,000 pyramid involves seeing a list of things and then understanding what unites them. What is the common denominator? So she is framing her own story um, in categories. Yes. Uh, when You Reach Me was a little more dark and serious than First Light. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, uh, is your next book you're going to write, if you're going to write another one, will it be more like When You Reach Me or First Light? That's an interesting question. Will the next book be more like When You Reach Me or First Light? Um, the main character at this point in my next book is um, a boy. And um, First Light is told partly from the point of view of a boy. It's, there's two characters, one's a boy, one's a girl. And um, I have to say it's going to be more like When You Reach Me. Um, not in terms of the plot, but in, ter but, um, in its attempt to acknowledge some of the harder, darker sides of childhood. I had a question about Frank, your class with Frank McCourt. Yes. Didn't he make you stand up and read at some point? No. Because I think you said you never did. He never made us stand up. He didn't force you to stand up. Frank McCourt did not force you to stand up. He didn't call on you. And, you know, maybe he should have. I don't know. I might have just collapsed on the spot. <laughs> yes. What inspired you to write When You Reach Me? Um, the plot? was inspired by a newspaper article I read about a man with amnesia. Um, it was a story in the Times about a guy in northwest part of the country. He was walking around and he realized he had no idea who he was or where he was from. And he started going up to people on the street and asking for help. He eventually, they all ran away from him, of course. And he eventually found a police officer 
who brought him to a hospital. And under hypnosis, he um, remembered things that, um, he remembered a terrible accident. And when, when um, they finally figured out who this guy was, this accident had not yet happened. Um, so it, this whole story just gave me the idea about people walking around with memories of their futures. And that was the inspiration for the plot. And then a lot of the story was inspired by my own childhood in New York City. It's set in the time and the place of my growing up. And one of the main characters, um, the laughing man, is someone who, who we called the laughing man, who stood on my corner um, pretty much all the time. And I was afraid of him. And I would run by him you know, at a full sprint every day on my way to school. And um, that character became woven into the story and along with a lot of other memories of childhood. Yes? Uh, what book do you think you enjoy more and why? Enjoy writing? No, what, yeah, writing. Um, you know, I actually think that my first novel, First Light, was an attempt to create the kind of story that I loved reading as a kid. Um, I was a big fantasy and science fiction fan, and I loved secrets and mysteries and secret worlds. And I think that uh, I drew a lot of inspiration from my own love of reading, and so it kind of led me toward the kinds of books I loved reading as a kid. The second book, um, it's much, a, a much more of a delving into the kind of person I was as a kid and the kind of weird thoughts I had as a kid. And it is a little darker in a way um, and, and truer probably to who I am and who I was, um, you know, at 11, 12, 13. And they're completely different types of pleasure, you know. Um, I loved writing both of them. I think the second one was probably a little bit more organic because I was just pulling stuff out of my brain and, um, and out of my memory. So I'm, I guess I'm avoiding your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's so hard to say, but I, I think if I had to lean one way or the other, I would say when you reach me, um, had some some moments of intense like pleasure like I'm finally expressing what I feel about some things and what I think about childhood and that was pretty wonderful yes uh, I'm a children's librarian and I read yes. in the school library journal that the reason you set the story in the 60s mm -hmm. when I said it's the heaven you contemporary was because uh, in the story as a plot device it helped for Miranda to have more freedom and I know from my own childhood that we were much less supervised at that time. Yes. Which do you think is better for children developmentally, to be uh, given the freedom or having the more supervision now? Wow. Um, I'm not an expert. I do think that kids at age 11 and 12 um, really benefit from the knowledge that we see them as capable people. And we don't think that they need to be completely protected. I mean, I, like every parent, think it's important to protect children. And like every person, parent or non-parent. But um, at the same time, I think it's important for kids to see that we trust them and that we know that they are self-possessed and that they possess judgment. And even if they make mistakes, um, you know, life goes on. I mean, you know, if I, I would feel terrible if, you know, my 12-year-old got into it on the street with somebody, uh, he would be really, really upset. And if he got something taken away from him, he would be upset by it. But life, would, life goes on. I mean, he would also get past it, and he would be okay. And so I, I do think it's important to give kids a measure of independence as long as you know, it's ultimately basically <coughs> safe. <laughs> yes. In your book, 
you talked about landing in the rocking patch and seeing yourself. Yes. Um, I actually didn't notice that the first time I read it, but after I read your book, I noticed that line. Did that uh, in some way inspire you to write the book? That part of A Wrinkle in Time? You know, actually, no. I had, Miranda was, car Miranda loves the book A Wrinkle in Time, and she's carrying it around throughout the book. And I um, wasn't sure that the book was going to stay in my book. I thought, you know, this is sort of a prop to remind me of the kind of kid Miranda is. Um, but A Wrinkle in Time, you can't just throw it in there. I mean, people have a lot of strong feelings about this book. And it's an important book in a lot of ways to many, many people of different generations. And um, I decided to reread the book as one of the characters in my book. Now, this is getting very, you know, meta. Um, I decided, you know what, since a lot of Miranda came from my own memory, I'm going to try to read A Wrinkle in Time from the point of view of Marcus, who's a character who's very unlike Miranda, right, in When You Reach Me. And that was when I saw it for the first time, when I sort of tried to channel this character of Marcus, who's like a very scientific thinker. And that was when I first noticed it and then thought, ooh, this is great. You know, this gives me a way to really start opening up questions about time and reality and what could happen. And so that is when I had the idea to use it. It, it was not early at all in the process of writing the book. It was like a little gift. Yes. Um, so in When You Reach Me, there's sort of like a circular plot, so every detail comes together in the end. Thank did you. Did it just come together that way, or did you add um, Did the plot just come together that way? You know, yes and no. I sometimes think that writing a book is a little bit like one summer in, in camp, I built this wooden box. And it, it was sort of loosely assembled at first, and then I had to kind of tighten everything at once so that um, it would all come out straight. And it's, that's kind of like a good analogy for, for finishing a book like this, because there are all these rough ed edges and things that are slightly um, unbalanced or off. And you, you know, I did want it to be completely straight, and I wanted it to make sense and to really satisfy you know that was always my question does it satisfy and so what we did was we had um, fresh readers my editor and I ask people who had never read the book before to read it every time I had a new draft and there were a number of drafts and we asked them where did you get snagged where did you get confused where did this become predictable where you know because the book requires a certain amount of tolerance of confusion <laughs> You have to be willing to be confused for a while. And you know, I don't underestimate the people who are reading my book, and I ask a fair amount of, you know, a fair amount from them. I expect them to be working a little when they're reading. And um, so it was like a long process of refinement. It, it was not just sort of organic, great, it came out that way. I sort of, I had the basic idea, but it needed a lot of little things. $20,000 pyramid yourself in the 70s? I did watch the $20,000 pyramid in the 70s, and um, actually my mom was a contestant on the $20,000 pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> but she, actually a surprising number of people, it turns out, have been contestants on that show. A lot of people have come to me and said, my sister was on it, or I was on it, my dad was on it. Um, my mom didn't win, so this was like, you know, important for me to revisit. We did win um, consolation prizes, including like a crate of dentine gum <laughs> that we dutifully chewed for months. <laughs> yes. Um, how did you react when you got the award for When You Reach Me? Um, how did I react? I was stunned and joyful. <laughs> yes. My mom was on Jeopardy. She didn't oh. win either, but. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> yeah. And my question, my question is, if you could eat, write the book from either the point of view of Sal or Marcus, who would you do? Sal or Marcus? That would be interesting. I don't know. Um, maybe Sal. Which would you most want to read? Oh. 
Marcus, then. <laughs> yes. Uh-oh, okay. We're in overtime, so one more. Okay, sorry, guys. Oh, I, before we're done done, I just want to say that I'm going to, I ran out of time at the reading, I mean at the signing, and some people who I wanted to meet, um, I didn't get to meet, and I'm really sorry for that because it was a hot, long line. Um, so I, we, we, tr we, we, a we added a short second signing, so, and I have instructions. It's going to start at, if you want to come, and then 1.30. I'm going to try to sign for 20 or even 25 minutes, maybe, and then I'm going to sprint somewhere else. And it's line 14. So line 14 at 1.30, we're I'm going to do a little bit more signing. Yes? Can you reach me, Dr. Newberry? Mm -hmm. So could you read the second place winner, the Newberry Honor? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a bunch of second place. Uh, well, I don't want to, you know, they're not second place. I guess they're, your, they're honors, right? Um, I have not read the honor books. Yeah, you know what? I have to say that for a while now, I've been reading um, a lot of um, what you would call adult books. And I find that when I'm trying to write a new book, which I have been trying to do very much for the last nine months since before the Newberry was announced, um, I've been fiddling with different kinds of gas, really, you know, like other people's books are kind of like gas in the tank for me. And so um, sometimes it's actually more productive for me to read adult books than it is for me to read children's books. And maybe it's because it's so different from what I'm creating. Um, but so I have been mostly focusing on those. So I have a pile of books next to my bed, which is like up to here, um, which I'm going to get to as soon as I finish this darn book that I'm writing right now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, thank you. It was a tremendous pleasure to be here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.